Okay, now the next, the next talk is one of my favorites because it's on crying children. And I was horrified when I went to Jamaica, from Jamaica to Canada in 1972. And then we worked with no supervision in emergency. We got a lot of experience. Three days on, three evenings, and three nights, right? Then you got three off. It was fun. But I'll tell you, we learned a lot. And people came, and I remember saying to the senior resident, I don't believe this. This woman is here with a crying baby. Don't all babies cry? And he, he was from Australia, and he said to me, Dr. Jarvis, you just came off the boat. <laughs> because uh, for some people, it's a crisis, all right? Um, again, no disclosures. The images are all from the teaching files that sick kids are my friends. And um, some things I modified to fit the slides. And why am I here? I must disclose, especially in winter time, I love coming here. Because why should I be in winter when I'm not a snow bunny? So thank you for having me again. So every parent uh, I seem to see in our emergency is the child cries. And it's very easy to get blasé when you're busy and say, oh Lord, another young mother and miss something serious. So I'm not asking you to dismiss, but it is true children cry and I hope to uh, give you some hints on understanding normal crying patterns. Um, you know, re I'm going to review quickly serious causes that you don't want to miss. You absolutely don't want to miss. And a few practical hints on how to deal with crying infants before their families abuse the babies and throw them out the window. Okay? So, babies have always cried. And uh, Shakespeare, who lived from 1564 to 1616, described it perfectly, right? Infants mew and puke. They cry and they vomit. It's always been like that, folks. Um, you know, uh, somehow that kind of missed the North American parents. Normal crying patterns have been described by some of the leaders of pediatrics in the Western world. Barry Brazelton in the States, um, Dr. Illingworth in England, and many others many others, that children cry on average two week from around two weeks of age for an hour and 45 minutes. And it peaks at six weeks for two hours and 45 minutes. Now you can say that's nothing, but if you're by yourself in an isolated situation in an inner city small apartment and the neighbors are hitting on your door and saying, keep that baby quiet. My husband has to sleep. He's working tonight. That two hours and 45 minutes is a very long time. Most of them have settled down by three months of age, unless you're premature. Those premature kids are irritable and fussy and difficult to feed and settle, and it can go on for a year, and that's not a joke. They need a lot of extra time and a lot of support to the family, right? And I don't know if it's because they sense that daddy is coming home and mom's anxious to have dinner ready or what's happening, but most of the crying is in the evening concentrated and this goes across cultures all right across cultures um, I'd be interested to hear what's the average pattern in the Gulf but I don't know if it's been studied right no before I make any other flippant remarks about parents not understanding normal crime I want you to memorize this I did submit a handout for you to have and take home. It cries. Please know these things. And every time you feel annoyed with some mom who you think is complaining too much, remind yourselves, right? 
I for infections, T for trauma, right? Remember, most strokes in childhood happen in the neonatal period. Does the child have a headache, right? You want to make sure. Cardiac disease, reaction to medications or reflux, fissures, right? Common things. Intersusception, don't ever miss it. Don't ever miss it. The eyes. Babies often scratch themselves in the eye. Right? Glaucoma. We see glaucoma in newborns and young infants. Or a strangulation or surgical process. So this is in the handout that I submitted. It cries. Please. One of the best studies done in Canada happened to be done by someone who's a former colleague of mine, Stephen Friedman. And again, he looked at, and this was done with a Saudi fellow, Nazreen. And uh, they published it. And I'll tell you, it hasn't changed at our institution since this was published. We are now seeing closer to, this year we'll hit 70 to 75,000 visits a year. Um, but I'll just tell you that children identified, right, um, with serious underlying disease remains very low. Very, very low. Okay? And this is very important to think about. All afebrile children who presented with crying and irritability, the chart was screened very carefully. They noted all investigations done and points of the history that were recorded. They managed to do a telephone follow-up six to 18 months later after the visit with 61% of the carers to ensure that nothing had been missed. Now, I'll tell you, people like to complain about my hospital. And anyhow, we miss something, it's in the newspaper. Trust me, we hear about things if we miss something. Furthermore, if the child's in the greater Toronto area and needed a surgical situation corrected, they would be transferred back to us. So we're pretty confident, unless there were a visitor to the country, that we have missed anything. And please notice that 237 children were identified. And of these, right, only 5% had serious underlying illness. It's very low, and that's why remember it cries. And keep that front of your brain when you're taking your history. Please, I beg you. They found that in 66.4% of the cases, the diagnosis was made on the history and examination, right? His, the diagnosis was based on positive tests after the history and exam in another 0.8%. Diagnosis based on tests ordered to investigate this crying because um, suggested um, by history or exam six, and then neither history nor exam nor investigations were diagnostic in 30%. All right? It's tremendous. And there are some very interesting things. This is why I love working at Sick Kids. Can you imagine a newborn or a child under a year of age with nephrolithiasis? How about spinal muscular atrophy? The child on examination was hypotonic, right? And was breathing very shallowly with diaphragmatic breathing. That's why the child was investigated. And um, Four of the cases were not diagnosed at the first visit, but the families came back to us, right? Anyhow, it's something, they come back to us. That's important to know. So I'm going to just illustrate with a couple histories some cases 
of the more serious illnesses, having said they are few and far between. And I personally saw most of these children. Ten day old, crying and fussiness for two days. On exam, fussy and will not settle. Intermittently cries and flexes up the legs. The skin was mottled and pale. And in fact, the child was crying so much that the nurse said she could hardly hear the heart sounds when she put the stethoscope on the chest. So she brought the child in to put the child on a monitor. And she got a rate of 280. All right? So why is the baby crying? The nurse thought at first it was colic. We always consider infection even if they're afebrile. She, with the flexing of the legs, at first she'd wondered if it was a surgical problem because we do see torsion of ovaries and hernias uh, obstruct, uh, uh, strangulated and so forth. And she wasn't sure, but the nurse made the diagnosis because the fussiness won't settle mottled pale skin, that's not normal. Most babies with colic are red in the face, right? They're absolutely red and angry. They sound angry. And uh, their pulses were weak and the heart rate was 280. So what does this child have? Right, well the nurse said it looked like sinus to her and it did turn out to be an SVT. And we have, you know, most SVT comes in in the first year of life. 90% is diagnosed in the first year. Uh, we see a lot of children under two months of age who present with crying or feeding difficulties. When they try to feed, they just get exhausted. So this was a good nurse who made the diagnosis for us, folks. All right? Made the diagnosis for us. So you see the retrograde P waves, and it was a re-entrant phenomenon, and guess what? Adenosine worked, and we also diagnosed Wolf Parkinson White. All right? So this was a triage nurse who decided this child couldn't stay screaming like that. She couldn't listen to the heart and lungs, and therefore um, got a diagnosis pretty quickly. So that's what I mean by not ignoring the crime. Not being able to settle is a serious finding, as is mottling. Two minutes. Thank you. Two month old, is he in pain? Please notice that the mother was breastfeeding. I hate this when people take the child off the breast and put them on formula. And she said he vomited everything and it was just the milk. And this child just looked fine. He, you know, he just looked fine. So the plan was to observe him and bring him into emergency, observation unit, have a nurse watch mother breastfeed. And as soon as the kid breastfed, he vomited everything. And he, he you know, he was two months, but it didn't shoot across the room. So I was on and having an interest in surgical things. I wondered if there was something stuck in the esophagus or so. So I started to put a nasogastric tube down and it came back um, green. This child was a malrotation. And you'll be surprised how many malrotation babies present with excessive fussiness and they've been crying on and off for a long while. Right? That's not this baby's x-ray. 11 week old came in and the parents said the child felt warm. They didn't own a thermometer, but the temperature we got was 38 and the child was fussy. So we did some investigations and this was a urinary tract infection. And I just want to tell you, urinary tract infections, you gotta check in the younger kids, almost any way they can present. And Dr. McGilvery, in the interest of time, I'm going to go over this, but he did a study showing that many don't have temperatures, irritability, query abdominal pain, change in urine color, change in urination pattern are all signs of UTIs, okay? 
And the last one is someone who is crying more than usual. Ten months, unwell, pale, fallen asleep. That was what we saw. I've highlighted for you the abnormal findings. And the important piece in the history, he was pale, falling asleep, and intermittently would cry, would just scream. And his abdomen seemed distended with general tenderness. And this little person, um, I actually sent for CT, uh, but not before I had um, taken a plain film of the abdomen to see if I saw an obstruction. And the plain film of the abdomen gave the diagnosis multiple fractured ribs. This was an abused child, and the father is now in jail. And the mother hadn't come in with the child because he'd beaten her up as well. We sent the police to the home. Right? So I just tell you, these things present any old way. Colic is the commonest cause. No form. Please don't stop breastfeeding. Please. Careful history. Careful examination. And you need to help your families to cope. Soothing music, gentle motion, going for a walk, rubbing the tummy, a nice warm wrap. Tell the mother it'll be over. Don't worry, don't keep taking the child to doctors. And she needs a break, so she needs to call on her support system. And she needs, I give them permission to have an hour off every day with a reliable person helping. Mommy, grandma, auntie, uncle, you know, best friends, anybody who's looked after a baby. And there are some self-help groups that really work. But we do see these children abused more than non-colicky babies. Any child who screams for six hours a day, you don't automatically have to x-ray, but you do have to help the parents to cope. Okay? So we'll stop here, and I'll take questions. Thank you, Dr. Jarvis. Any question? There's just a caution here. I don't know if you have these baby mixtures here, but gripe water is something that was very prevalent when I was in the West Indies. They still use it. And some of the brands have alcohol in them. And they've found poisons such as uh, mercury and other things in herbal medications. So you need to support the family. Tell them what's safe and what isn't safe. Okay? Okay, thank you. All right, thank you.